RX Television on rxmuscle.com. Ask Dave, powered by Species Nutrition and Liquid Sunrays. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. Before we start the show, we have a big, big announcement to make on the Species Nutrition front. We have a new retailer, a powerhouse retailer that's going to be carrying us. They're based in Kansas, Supplement Syndicate, Dave Palumbo. These are serious people. Kristen Nunn, the owner and operator of Supplement Syndicate, a serious competitor herself. This store is all about the serious athlete. Yeah, you know, I love the hardcore you know, stores. There's not that many of them around, but they're, they're, they're in pockets all over the country. And Kristen Nunn is certainly you know, the depiction of what we call hardcore. Uh, you know, she, she believes in this, the science of supplements. She's knowledgeable. She's in this store. She lives the lifestyle, as you can see her physique. And they're super supporters of species nutrition. And you know what? I really value that when someone gets behind a brand and can sell it based on its science and doesn't you know, argue with me about, oh, it's too expensive or this and that. They want the best of the best. And if you're in the Shawnee, you know, Kansas area and you're looking for a hardcore store that has the best of the best, you know, the Mercedes Benz of supplements, you know, stop by there. You'll get free advice. They'll tell you how to take supplements. They'll tell you what you should use, what you shouldn't use what you should look out for. And that's the kind of store that I want to put my brand of uh, Species Nutrition products in. A store that gets it. A store that's going to be, be there to educate, not just looking for profit margins. So once again, guys, if you're in the Shawnee uh, area of Kansas, stop in, say hello to uh, Kristen Teller, Dave Palumbo, RX Muscle, Species Nutrition sent you, and I'm sure she'll take great care of you. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions, of course, the Olympia, one month away in Las Vegas. Dave, we have some big news uh, to announce regarding the Olympia, which of course is going to be in four weeks' time in Vegas. Yep, the big news is number one will be there, <laughs> which, is, which, which was, which was kind of like uh, an iffy situation just because I wasn't sure if we were going to do it. Uh, Aaron Singerman of Redcon One stepped up to the plate. He's sponsoring all our coverage as well as Liquid Sunrays, the official, our official tanning sponsor of the Olympia coverage. And so we're going. You know, uh, we, we, I hope the, my flight is not going to be like a million dollars because I haven't booked it yet. But Sid and I will be out there with uh, Raphael Noble, uh, who our photographer, as well as Chris Aceto covering the show as we always do with all our helpers out there who come there to help us every year. And uh, it should be a great one. Obviously. Uh, Phil Heath going to try to tie, rec uh, I guess you could say, Olympia win number eight. Flex Lewis's last uh, Olympia. We have the Fitness Olympia crown vacated this year, so that's going to be a new one. Uh, Juliana Mal Malacarney is not going to be at the Olympia, so the Women's Physique Olympia crown will be vacated. So a lot of exciting stuff happening, and uh, a, a lot of great people stepped up to the plate to make this happen. You will be seeing over the next few days, we've been recording interviews with already some top Olympians, and we're going to be adding to that list. Last year, I believe, Dave, we did about, what, 34 pre-Olympia interviews know, or crazy. something to that effect. I hope, we um, don't do it I hope we don't do that many this year. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, you know, again, it's no, it's no state secret, but... With a lot of the media contracts coming to an end, we are going to have a lot more access uh, to some of the top Olympians uh, pre-Olympia, during the Olympia, and of course post-Olympia. So keep tuned. The Iron Road to the Olympia is officially underway again, as Dave mentioned, powered by Redcon 1. And of course, our official tanning sponsor, Liquid Sunrays. Let's go to the questions. Our first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. The first question, Dave, lately I've seen people starting to use Victoza slash Saxenda. What do you think of those products? You know, they're interesting products. What they are is they're uh, what's called glucagon-like peptides. They're, you know, when, you're, when you eat a meal and your small intestine senses food, it releases the GLP peptides. And what they do is they basically tell you, you're, you're, tell you number one, you're full. It's, it slows the digestive tract down. But more importantly, what it does is it actually increases the output of insulin. Uh, so if you don't produce enough insulin, it will help the pancreas produce more insulin. And it also reduces the liver from producing glucose via gluconeogenesis. Now, the, as we know, the liver is constantly producing uh, glucose from amino acids in the liver. We can't stop that from happening, or so we thought. <laughs> but we can slow it down a little bit. 
And the advantage of that is if, you, if your liver is constantly cranking out glucose, you've got to produce insulin to absorb that glucose. Obviously, insulin is a fat storage hormone. We don't want a lot of insulin output okay, by the body or excessive insulin output by the body because our bodies are cranking out glucose. So a lot of people have started using this uh, Saxenda, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Victoza or Saxenda product okay, to help with weight control because it kind of makes you feel satiated um, because it, it slows digestive, di digestive tract down and it also helps reduce the output of insulin okay, by reducing the liver's production of glucose. Now, this is an advantage for people for weight loss. Um, it's used to be used, it's, well, I guess you could say it's, it's medical use is for type 2 diabetics that can't control their blood sugar. Uh, I think mostly because it reduces the output of liver glucose. Um, but I've seen bodybuilders start to use it now for appetite control, okay, for weight loss because it, it once again, it reduces insulin output and it reduces the amount of insulin you need because you're not producing as much glucose from the liver. So I, don't, I haven't used it personally, but I do know some people who are using it and have successfully used it, especially a lot of people who have appetite control issues. Um, it seems to be a much more natural way to control your appetite as opposed to taking, you know, ridiculous amounts of stimulants and Adderall and stuff like that to try to, you know, kill your appetite. That doesn't seem to work well and there's always a rebound off that. So I think we're going to see a lot more use of it as it becomes more available and uh, as people start experimenting it with more. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, great interview with Stan Efferding. Do you think his approach is optimal using all food sources over shakes and vitamins if you can actually do it? Optimal, no. Um, practical, no. But, you know, it works. You know, look, eating whole foods, if you can get your nutrition from whole foods, and I think it's very, very difficult to get everything you need from whole foods. And I, I think even Stan would say the same thing. He's a big believer in, in, in supplementing with, you know, multivitamins and multiminerals and stuff like that. I know he uses a lot of my products as well uh, from Species Nutrition. But, you know, his, uh, his approach is for the average person, if you can kind of, you know, if you can kind of try to get all your food groups in and try to get, you know, the right amount of nutrients not the stuff that they tell you about in school, the, the right nutrients that our bodies need from the food you're eating, that, that's going to help your body you know, long term, especially if you're eating a lot of food. So you know, it's difficult for a lot of people to do this because it requires a lot of pre-planning. So for, that's why I say from a practical standpoint, I don't think it's that, it's that doable. I think for most bodybuilders, they, have, they really want to just focus on protein, essential fats, carbs. And then all their vitamins and minerals, they just they don't worry about eating vegetables and stuff like that because it's just extra calories. So they take that in supplement form. The problem is if you don't use a good high quality protein, excuse me, high quality supplement, minerals, vitamins, you know, in the right dosages, absorbability, then you you really are hurting yourself. And I think from for those people who are not willing to spend a few bucks and get the right stuff, and I'm not just saying that v, that my species nutrition line of the mineralized or megalized are the right stuff because it is the right stuff. But if you don't want to buy my products or you don't have access to them, there are other products out there that, that can fill that void. But if you're not doing that, then you damn as hell better eat it in your meals. Um, to me, it just seems it's cheaper and easier to do it through the supplemental form. Probably the right approach is somewhere in the middle, as it always is. Try to get some of it from your foods, some of it from supplemental form. Somewhere in the middle is the ideal situation. And I think that's the way it is in life. And I think it's good to always get people thinking about what they're doing. And that's what Stan and I try to do in that interview. And I think what Stan's doing with his vertical diet, it's getting people thinking about what they're doing. Because even if you don't follow everything he tells you, if you pick up a few extra tips and uh, nutritional, you know, I guess you could say shortcuts from him, then, that, that, then hey, your takeaway message was well received. We'll take questions from our Instagram. Again, our Instagram handle is official underscore RX muscle. We tease our Olympia coverage, follow our Instagram up until the Olympian. And of course, throughout Olympia weekend, we're going to have loads of content on our Instagram feed, on Twitter, Facebook, and of course, on the YouTube channel. Dave, you mentioned the women's physique division, Julianne Malacarney, of course, vacating her title. Uh, Trent Riddlehoover, your thoughts on the women's physique class. I read what they're looking for, but from what I read, it basically said, don't get too shredded. Is there a size cap or what he goes on to say about his friend getting overlooked in the division? Go into detail about your thoughts of the class and its specifications. You know, 
I've been watching and following women's bodybuilding from probably since 1988, I think that was the first year I really was paying attention to what's going on. And you know what? They've been trying to control how big, how hard, how this, how that, these girls have been getting. And you know what the truth is? Every single year, the bottom line is that whatever looks best on stage is what the judges vote for. At the end of the day, if the girl, if they say cut back your size, but the girl was big, but it looked feminine and it flowed well, she won. That was the best physique on stage. That's always the case. The problem is that some of these people get so out of control with trying to be the biggest, hardest, that they start turning it into like a, it's like it becomes a freak show and it doesn't look good. So you can't say to the hardest, biggest girl on the show that, hey, you're not the best up there because she might be from a physique standpoint, but from an aesthetic standpoint, she's not. So the bottom line is they try to keep it from getting out of control. And I think that's a good thing. We don't want women's physique turning into women's bodybuilding the way it got when it was out of control. I think women's bodybuilding now is actually not too bad. Um, although there's not that many competitors left. Most of them have gone to women's physique or retired. The key is to look feminine. It, look, it's very easy to take a ton of drugs, okay, as a woman bodybuilder or a women's physique competitor and, and, and put on muscle and get shredded. Okay, it's a lot harder to take a small amount, okay, and, and, and keep your femininity and focus on diet and training as a way of getting in shape. But when you do it that way, it looks better. Juliana Malacarney is, is the poster girl for that child, for this, for this division. Why? Because she was feminine, she looked great, she presented herself well, she never put excessive amounts of muscle on, yet it was a, it was a look that people like said, hey, I like that, I want love to look like that. And that's, you know, that's what the division was created for. And, you know, I, you know I, I'm pretty, I, there's a couple of women out there that I'm very impressed with their physiques. You know, I, obviously, I've talked very highly of Shanique Grant. I don't think she's excessively big. I don't think she's excessively hard. She's got killer genetics and killer structure. And everything that she puts onto that structure looks great because of it's in the right places. And I think that, you know, she's going to be tough to beat, especially with Juliana leaving. However, there's other competitors that are up there as well. I think if, if a competitor is listening to the, the advice that the IPB is giving and they take it literally, they'll come in too smooth and they'll do terrible. Come in at your best. Just don't do extreme things. Cole, NPC, good friend of the show. With active release and deep tissue work done, do you ever find that it's more, there's more growth in areas and less scar tissue around injection sites? With getting regular massages, is that what he's implying? Yeah, active Yeah, of release. course, of yeah. course. Whenever you get regular massages, you're breaking up the scar tissue before it forms. You're moving, you know, if you're doing injections into certain areas, you're moving the volume out of there so it's not stagnating and building up, you know, connective tissue, you know, uh, bridges. So, yeah, of course, uh, massage is always a great thing to do. If you can do it, I mean, I know Jay Cutler used to get massages like five times a week or something like that, I think, when he was competing. So, uh, obviously, at some point, you know, most people can't afford to do that. But I was, when I was in the pr my prime, I was trying to get a massage every week or pretty close to it. And it, it definitely helped with recovery. I, there's no doubt in my mind. Ronnie K. Walker, is extra virgin olive oil bad to cook with? I've heard it's not a good oil to use if cooking with it at high temperatures. I've heard macadamia nut oil, which obviously you suggest, and coconut oil are better. Any truth to this? Yeah. Uh, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, has a very low smoke point, meaning that if you heat it too hot, it degrades and it loses all its health benefits. Um, and it actually can become a negative type, a, a bad fat. So um, you don't want to be heating. If, you, if you're lightly sauteing for a few minutes with, with olive oil, it's fine. It's when you start heating it up too hot, it, it just goes to sh crap. That's why I, and, and plus, you know what? I don't trust any olive oil on the market right now because there's so many fakes out there with tons of soybean oil padding it. It's almost like protein spiking was a couple years ago. They, they're, they're spiking the olive oil with, with, with cheap soybean oil. So... I don't even go there. I don't even. I know people say, "Well, this brand is good," and that. I don't even bother. I look. I, I make a brand of macadamia oil because I couldn't depend on the olive oil, and because I truly believe that mac oil is a better oil. It's higher in monounsaturated fats. It has a perfect balance of omega threes to omega sixes, one to one ratio. Only fat that has that. You can cook with it. It has a super high smoke point. Okay. It doesn't oxidize when exposed to light. It doesn't go bad. It doesn't go rancid. And it, you know what? It tastes like butter. There's, there's no disadvantage, there's no oil out there that's more, more all-purpose than that. 
You know, coconut oil makes everything taste like coconut. Plus, it's, it's not an essential fatty acid. It's a, it's, a, it's a saturated, it's a short chain or medium chain saturated fat, which is not necessarily bad for you, but it just can be, it really only gets used as a fuel source. It doesn't have any other purpose in the body. It does have some immune system stimulating effects uh, they found, but by and far, MAC oil is, if you're going to put oils into your body, that's the type of oil you want to put in there uh, in terms of in volume, okay? When you go for essential fatty acids, you could take them in supplement form because you don't need as many of them. But monounsaturated fat should be the main driving fats source of the body. John Daniel, will taking expired gear or HGH have a negative effect on your body? I always tell this to people. The worst case scenario uh, is that expired gear just won't work or it won't work as well. When, when something hits an expiration date, it doesn't just deactivate itself, okay? Most of the stuff is good for years afterwards. Um, if it's not being kept in a, in a stable temperature environment, it could start to degrade, but it's not gonna just go from, from full potency to nothing because you hit a certain date of the calendar year, okay? It is gonna start to slowly degrade. And it might take, like I said, it could take 10 years before it stops working. Um, I, you know, back in the day, had given a friend of mine some kits of growth hormone I had. I forgot because I just, I don't know what was going on. I didn't want to keep them in my house. I was paranoid or something like that. And I forgot I gave it to him. And like, like seriously, like five or six years later, he told me, you know, I got these, these things in my refrigerator. Do you need them? And I completely forgot about them. And, you know, I used them and they, and they worked fine. So I just don't believe, like I said, as long as you're keeping things in a, in a temperature controlled environment, you really have nothing to worry about. Seth Burglar, your thoughts on sprouted wheat bread as a carb source versus oatmeal. I get sick of eating the same thing all the time and it's nice to switch it up here and there. Yeah, you know, I like sprouted, you know, breads, but you know, you gotta be careful. Some of them have a lot of sugar. They put honey in them, they put sugar in them, and you know, that, that adds up, you know, quite a bit, you know, especially, you know, obviously if you're dieting, you wouldn't want to be eating that stuff. Um, but the ones that don't have any added sugars to them, though they're fine. You know, I don't have a problem, especially the off season. Off season, you don't need to be so tightly controlled. Um, sometimes it's good to kind of you know loosen up your, your eating as long as you're not eating foods that are gonna you know get you fat. You know, um, you know, putting tons and tons of ketchup all over every single meal you eat in the off season is not something I would recommend. If you use a little ketchup here and there, that's fine. Now I wouldn't use it pre-contest, obviously. You can loosen up off season, but that doesn't mean you should be just putting tons of extra unnecessary calories onto your foods that are really not doing anything positive for you. B underscore fit. Dave, I have a friend who eats a lot of fish in his diet. His mercury levels on his blood work came back in the upper 20s. Could this be from the quantity of fish he's eating or would it be, would it be a quality issue of the fish itself? Both probably. If you're eating fish that has mercury in it and you're eating a lot of it, obviously you're going to get a lot of mercury in your, in your bloodstream. If you're eating fish that has mercury in it but you're only eating it once, you know, once every couple days, you're going to have much lower levels, maybe not that much at all. So of course it's always dose dependent. You know, when Jason Ha, when I interviewed him, he had severe mercury you know, toxicity. He was eating you know, sea bass. He loved it. He thought it was a great fish. It was healthy. It was wild caught. And he was, it had tons of mercury in it, and he was eating it like, like pounds of it every day. So, of course, he had a much, much worse, uh, I guess you could say, situation uh, going on in his body than, say, the person who would eat sea bass, but maybe only, you know, twice a week uh, and, and only once a day. So, it, it just goes to, you got to gotta know what the fish is you are. I try to stay away from eating tons of tuna, even though I love tuna. You know, I'm not talking about tuna in the cans. I'm talking about the big, the big uh, sushi tunas. I also, I also, I love swordfish. I would eat it every day if I could, but it's, I know it's got mercury in it. And you know, there's, that's just the way it is. I try to eat more salmon. Salmon, wild caught salmon seems to be better. Yeah, this could be some PCBs in there. They're saying, you know, but there's no, at least there's no heavy metals in salmon. Uh, so that's where I try to get most of my fish from. I also try to eat a lot of white fishes, um, you know, that maybe don't, you know, like cod and stuff like that. They're small fishes. They don't really accumulate these heavy metals in them. So once again, you know, Everything will kill you if you, eat, if you eat the wrong type of foods and you eat too much of it. So try to spread it out and eat different sources of protein. It's funny, nowadays, you know, red meat was so out of vogue. Now it seems like everyone wants to eat red meat because it's like the only thing that's safe nowadays. Dave DeCoke, Dave, is there a way to minimize water retention in the off season? I hold so much water through the day. I'm curious how to limit it. So what, what I heard, he, he holds water and he wants to know how to avoid the water retention in the off season? Minimize in the off yeah. season, correct. All right. You know, 
the easiest way to stop water retention is to eat lower carbohydrates. Because the more carbohydrate, because you could, look, the reason why you hold water in the off season and not pre-contest is because you're eating way more carbohydrates. When every gram of carbohydrates that you eat, you retain a certain amount of fluid with it. That's just the nature of, of carbohydrate uh, storage in the body. When you store glucose as glycogen in the muscles and in the liver, you store water with it. So the, if you're gorging on carbs all day, you're gonna retain a lot of fluid from it. So if, if, if it's get that uncomfortable, cut back your, your, your carb intake and you'll see that water go down quite a bit. Likewise, if you're taking excessive amounts of GH, which will make you retain fluid, you might want to cut that dosage back as well. Let's go to one extra rep. I'm a type 1 diabetic and take Lantus first thing in the morning every day. I have a new doctor who suggested that I take it before going to bed every day instead. Since insulin and GH bind to the same receptors, will taking Lantus at night negatively affect the GH from reaching its receptors or vice versa? First of all, um, GH really doesn't have receptors that we know of. Uh, when you take growth hormone, your body breaks the growth hormone down in the liver and releases a hormone known as IGF-1. IGF-1 will bind to IGF-1 receptors. Now, sometimes IGF-1 can also bind to insulin receptors and have what we, what we call an insulin-like effect. That's where it gets its name, insulin-like growth factor 1. Uh, that's not negative because it's doing the same thing as insulin. So, um, once again, you know, Taking, you know, Lantus, okay, which is supposed to be a 24-hour insulin, a long-acting insulin, okay, is, first of all, you shouldn't be taking it once a day. You should be taking it twice a day. These doctors are imbeciles, okay? Lantus is a known not to last that long. You should be taking a nightly injection before bed, and you should be taking a morning injection. Now, Lantus is a long-acting or what we call basal insulin. It doesn't just have an immediate effect. It has a very low-key, subtle, in-the-background effect. So that's why you could take it before bed and you're not going to get hypoglycemic. If you took a shot of like Humalog before bed and didn't eat anything, you'd be, you'd be, you know, you'd, your blood sugar would drop to nothing. You'd be ready to, you know, go into a coma. But that's not how long-acting insulins work. So they don't really interact negatively with GH. GH and insulin actually works, they, they can kind of positively interact because the insulin will overcome the insulin, uh, insulin resistance that the GH causes. So, you know, when I, when I recommend that people take fast-acting insulins, I usually do have them take it in the morning with GH and, and the fast-acting together. Uh, so it has a synergistic effect rather than an antagonistic effect. But when we talk about also, when we talk about these long-acting insulins like Lantus, it, it has no bearing on, on you taking GH. You, first of all, I would take GH in the morning. I, don't I wouldn't take it at night because your body naturally releases it at night. And I would take my Lantus half in the morning, half at night. Let's go to Kyle Marinucci. Please ask Dave, what amount of T3 or Cynomel would be considered too high? Would 75 mg's be considered too high? How to taper down properly to avoid unnecessary fat gain pulse contest? I won't ever go over 100 micrograms a day. I, I find that to be a safe amount um, that people could take without having any negative side effects. And once again, you're not just going from zero to 100. You're, you're ramping up over a very long period of time, maybe over you know, two, three, month, three four months, um, taking, starting out at 25 micrograms and slowly every couple of weeks building up to it. You know, if you did it overnight, you would have problems because your body acclimates to it, okay? Um, I never found any problems with 100 micrograms per day. I've even gone a little, little bit higher, sometimes just a pinch higher for maybe a week or two. Um, but that seems to be uh, the ideal amount. I mean, most people don't need to go that high, but you can go that high without a problem. Now, when coming off Cytomel, you, the, what I use is I use a two-week uh, weaning off period. So for the, no matter how high you are, the first week I would immediately drop it down to 25 micrograms per day, okay? And I'd do that for a week. Then I would do another week at, at half of that, 12.5 micrograms per day, and then go off. Because what happens is it, it's a very, you know, thyroid hormone is a really a direct feedback type mechanism, meaning that when you take, when the body senses T3 in the body, active thyroid hormone, it shuts down the signal in the brain, okay? The, the signal in the brain is, is, the, uh, is the hormone that's released by the hypothalamus to tell the pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone, okay? When you take away the, the T3, okay, your, your pituitary kicks back on and starts producing more thyroid stimulating hormone so that your thyroid glands can start producing. That's why taking T3 really doesn't have any negative effect on the body. It's a very, very easy back and forth process. Now, what happens in a lot of times, and I've mentioned this before, 
is that, hey, we lost some lights here. I don't know. Oh, uh, you know, I have, it's funny, I hear thunder in the background. I'm not going to stop recording. I have a generator. I just paid a, a super amount, high amount of money for a generator. Let's see if the generator kicks on because, <laughs> because I want to make sure I got my money's worth. I have a feeling one of these is plugged in, uh, Tyler, to another outlet that, that probably blew a fuse. But we do have one light on, so I'm going to continue in the dark. Uh, We're at 25 minutes too, so maybe it gets... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tyler, Tyler's trying to get me, he wants to go home basically. Um, but anyway, thyroid, so a lot of people what happens is that they have low thyroid and they don't know it, and then they take Cytomel, T3, and they lose a lot of weight, and then they say, okay, it's time to wean off of it. And they wean off of it and they like, they never feel normal again. Because they didn't realize they, how great they felt when they took the Cytomel. And then they go and get blood work and they find out that they're low, they have low T3. Meanwhile, they had it all along, they just didn't know it. And they think that they, they blame the, the fact that they took the Cytomel as to causing the hypothyroidism, when that's just not the case. Very, very, very few instances occur where a person takes T3 and actually shuts down their thyroid gland permanently from it. Very, very infrequently happens. Yeah, it's a wrap. Oh, it, it shut off? No, we're recording. What's wrap though? Oh, all right. So I guess, I, I guess no one wants to record in the dark anymore. I, did we lose Sid? Yeah, we lost Oh, we lost it. Okay, guys, sorry. You know, sometimes you know, Mother Nature tells us when it's time to end the show. <laughs> it is after hours here. You know, we were doing a lot of recording this week, and uh, this Wednesday especially, we, we were going late today. I hope you guys enjoy all the questions. Make sure you subscribe below. Uh, turn on your notifications. Leave us comments, what you want me to talk about. Remember, you can always post questions to our uh, official uh, underscore RX Muscle Instagram page, our, on the RX Muscle forums, on our Facebook. We have so many different avenues where you can submit your questions to, and I will always answer them. Unfortunately, for Sid Faruqi and our producer Tyler Shore, I'm Dave Palumbo, and we'll see you next time.